it's puzzle solving. And that's one of the things I love about doing science. It's really puzzle solving. And the other part of it is that what you find is so beautiful. Nature is, nature's designs are so elegant. And I'm a very empirical scientist. Um, I don't theorize because what usually happens is that the answer, the, the biological mechanisms that are used are usually far more elegant than the theories that people come up with. And so, of course, you have to have a hypothesis or some kinds of ideas to begin to explore. You know, for example, the idea that there are proteins in the nose that recognize odorants was a quite reasonable one, and there was some indirect evidence for it. The question was how to find them. And um, what I decided to do was to try to find genes encoding these molecules. And I think Richard Axel also agreed that this was the logical thing to do. So I set out to do that. Uh, instead of looking for a job and getting a faculty position, I stayed on there with his blessing. I actually looked for a job. And of course, I just said, I didn't say I was going to work on a plesia. I said, I'm going to do this, which of course people would think was impossible. And I could never have gotten a grant to look for this because who knows, maybe I wouldn't have found the receptors. Um, so I set out to do it and I, I worked very hard to do this. At one point, I switched over to working until 5 a.m so that I would have all the lab equipment to myself. And I worked very long hours. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was, um, but I loved it. You know, so what you do is basically try to come up with an idea. How are you going to find what you're trying to find? And I tried several things before I hit on the right one. But it, it took, um, taking a, a recently developed technique and then changing that, modifying that, so kind of adding some layers onto that, and then pulling in some other way to analyze the data. So basically I used PCR which at that time was a relatively new technique. But I used, I, I modified it so that um, I would, I developed a combinatorial PCR approach. So I made the assumption that these proteins in the nose would be at least distantly related to other proteins that served as receptors or detectors on the surface of other cell types. There were some of these known, and there was some evidence that suggested that the proteins in the nose might transduce signals to the interior of the cell using similar mechanisms to some other receptors. It wasn't as if I stood back and I thought, what's the most, what is the most important thing? I mean, I think, I remember when I started graduate school that um, I did survey what was around me and decide what was the import, most important thing I thought to do. And I think that that was in the backdrop, that I wanted to do something important, but I don't remember um, thinking, this is an important thing, this is an important thing. I might have done that, but I was always, I was interested in taking on very challenging problems and ones that I thought were important. What? I was never interested in taking small steps and adding bricks. I was always attracted to the, I think, bigger questions. And the, more, and the challenges didn't bother me. I didn't, this was actually a very high risk.
project, and in retrospect, it was potentially suicidal. I didn't have to find the receptors. I mean, potentially suicidal in terms of a career. But actually, that didn't matter to me uh, at that time. Eventually, I found the receptors, and it was, um, it was really beautiful. I remember just being stunned looking at them when I first had the first set of them. And uh, it was a Saturday night, I think, and I was in my kitchen, and I had colored pens. And I had written down the sequence, because at that time, um, we didn't have the software for analyzing sequence, uh, DNA sequence information that we have now. But So I had translated the sequences into proteins, and I was comparing the different ones and I was coloring in places where they were the same. And I remember thinking that it was that it was like patchwork quilts, where bits and pieces were exchanged between the different receptors to make proteins that would have different, be able to detect different odorants. And I had a friend in the other room who was um, watching TV or something. And I kept running back and forth saying, look at this, can you believe this? And it was just absolutely thrilling. So then, after that, we published the paper, and I'd been in Richard Axel's lab forever and, and working very independently. He was quite unusual in that regard, that he would, once, once people got their sea legs, so to speak, he would just let them go. And um, so, but it was really, I was very eager to have my own lab. So I moved to Harvard Medical School. I became uh, an assistant professor there in neurobiology. And my next goal was to um, determine how the signals from these receptors in the nose were translated by the brain into perceptions. So there are actually about 350 different odorant receptors in humans and about 1,000 different ones in mice. Mice we use as a model organism to understand um, how these systems work. So over the next 10 years at Harvard, um, we used genes encoding the odorant receptors to try to understand how information is encoded in the system and to give different perceptions. And I was um, very fortunate to have a series of wonderful students and postdoctoral scientists that worked with me over that period. And um, it was a tremendous amount of fun just trying to figure out how it worked. And we, we found out how information from the thousand different receptors is organized first in the nose and then in the two major relay uh, centers in the brain, the olfactory bulb, which is in the front of the brain, and then the olfactory cortex. We don't really know how the brain works, um, by and large. I mean, it's still a black box. And, um, you know, the I think 1990s were the decade of the brain but it still is not understood what a perception is exactly. How, what happens in the brain when you perceive something? You see a friend walking down the street toward you and maybe they say something to you. There's activity in neurons in many parts of the brain. How do those come together to form a percept, a perception? It's not known. We don't even know what the neural circuits are that underlie appetite. We don't know what happens when we feel an emotion like love. Or we look at a beautiful piece of art. It's, the brain is still a mystery to us. And it's, it's the most challenging area to me of, of biological science today. And I'd like to encourage 
the wonderful students that, that are here at this Academy of Achievement Summit to consider a career in neuroscience to try to figure out how the brain actually works. It's a fascinating, challenging, um, very satisfying and rewarding thing to do, I think. I love doing science. I love thinking about it. I love trying to figure out how to solve a problem. And um, I love working with the people in my lab, the students and postdocs, and exchanging ideas and trying to come up with strategies and trying to figure out the data. So I don't work at the bench anymore myself. They work at the bench. And then we discuss data. And we try to figure out what it means. So, and that's a lot of fun. Like, when you see results that you don't expect, you thought it might have worked one way, and then you see something that doesn't really match what you imagined. And then you try to figure out what could be going on. It's, um, intellectually, it's, it's like a game. You know, it's trying to figure out how to answer a question and exploring different possibilities and then carrying it out if you're actually working at the bench, which I don't anymore. And then looking at the data and it usually turns out that it doesn't work the way you thought. Not exactly anyway. And it's really when you get the answers that you didn't expect that you learn the most. So you see, you see the results, and then you think, how, how could that be? Why, why did we get these results? And then you get ideas, and that stretches your imagination further. And I think that that's where the greatest discoveries are made, when you find things that you never imagined. And then you have to work to try to understand them, and then you test those new ideas. You do have to be patient, and um, oftentimes things don't work. You have to repeat them, you have to change them. In fact, I've often pointed out to students, this is why they call it research. <laughs> because you really have to do it over and over again. And, but it's, it's really the process that's, that's interesting. And that's also where you learn. I was just saying to a wonderful student in my lab recently, just a brilliant student that um, pointing out how much she had learned by having to um, try different things, to think, to do research in the literature, to try to come up with how to solve the problem that she was trying to solve and integrate things that she learned into the design of her experiment. She's grown tremendously over the last year. And I'm so proud of her. You know, she's, she's learned things that I didn't know. And that's how, you, that's how you grow. And in doing that, you learn and it's satisfying. And then when you get a result, it's fantastic. But it's, it's fun, the process is fun. It's the day-to-day, -day. you don't, I don't, anyway, um, do science because of something that's going to happen in the distant future, like I will get a paper or I will get a prize. It's because I like actually doing it. I think I had a pretty normal childhood. Um, I just did the things that kids do. Uh, my mother was a homemaker and my father was an electrical engineer. I would say that I had a lot of independence to do things that I wanted to do. Um, there were three girls and uh, no boys, so my father often tried to get me to do projects with him. He liked to invent things and build them in the basement, so he tried to engage me in that. I usually said I'd rather play dolls, <laughs> but I did do some things with him. 
and uh, he wanted me to learn Morse code. He was going to teach me Morse code so I could get an amateur radio license because he had a giant tower that he built in our backyard so he would communicate with people all over the world. But I wasn't really interested in that. But I think I was a curious, curious child. And um, interested in doing, I, I think I got bored pretty easily. So I was always looking for new things to do. I can remember my grade school teachers. And I remember a high school teacher who I actually uh, met again very recently in Seattle at a community luncheon that was given. And um, she was a biology teacher. And I remembered her vividly because I enjoyed very much the class. And uh, it was really wonderful. But even then, I didn't really think that I was going to become a scientist. I never imagined that as a child that I would be a scientist. And even in high school, I didn't think of becoming a natural scientist. I thought I'd always wanted to do something where I would help people. So I thought of being a psychologist, psychotherapist, perhaps. And then when I went to the University of Washington, I decided to major in psychology, thinking that that's what I would do. But then as I took more classes, I became interested in many other things. And I, I uh, was drawn toward research. But in a way, I didn't think at the beginning that it would satisfy that requirement that I had, that internal requirement to do something to help other people. Uh, so it, very, it actually took me quite a long time to come around to the realization that you could do something for people. It was more abstract, but you could by doing research. And um, meanwhile, I, I thought about doing a number of different things. And uh, eventually, I took a course in immunology. And that's when I decided what I wanted to do. I finally knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do research. And so I went to graduate school then in, in uh, immunology at UT Southwestern in Dallas, where they had uh, a kind of unusual program. They had, had recently recruited a number of different immunologists there. And it was still a pretty young field. And so it was a really wonderful opportunity for getting a good background in that area. It was so fascinating to me. So I was looking for something that was right. And I didn't want to do anything until I found the right thing. And it took more time. But I found just what I wanted to do. And I was very, very happy. I just loved it. And I just never looked back after that. I found the right thing. Now, I changed from immunology at a later time. Um, I got my degree. I went to New York City, to Columbia University, and worked with an immunologist there at the beginning, Ben Veduto Pernas. And um, I was doing what's called cellular immunology, so looking at the behavior of cells. But I was always interested in the molecular mechanisms. And I was always thinking in terms of molecules. What were the molecules doing on the surface of the cells that were communicating with other cells or that were recognizing external stimuli that the immune system recognizes and responds to to protect the body? So I was getting frustrated because I was doing cellular experiments to try to get insight into the molecular mechanisms so meanwhile, uh, the field of molecular biology had been growing and taking off. And it was becoming more possible to actually study the molecules themselves, to study genes encoding the molecules. And by studying the genes, get more insight into the molecules. So I decided that I wanted to uh, learn molecular biology, learn the techniques of molecular biology, so I could more directly answer the questions I wanted to, to address. 
And for that reason, I went to the laboratory of Richard Axel, who was a molecular biologist at Columbia. And I thought this would be much faster to stay there and go to the Axel laboratory than move somewhere else, because I just had to move laterally in the same building. And I ended up staying there forever. <laughs> um, but that was OK. It was uh, a really good choice. And so I went to the Axel Laboratory. And he had gotten interested in neuroscience through a recent collaboration with Eric Kandel, who is a world-renowned neuroscientist, who actually got the Nobel Prize for his work on learning and memory in 2000. But um, he had been studying learning and memory for many years, and he had been using a model organism called Aplysia, which was a sea snail. And um, he had studied that because it had very simple, a very simple nervous system, and it also had giant neurons that were very easy to study. And so Richard Axel had begun a collaboration with him, studying neurons in the sea snail, using molecular biology to study genes involved in the nervous system. And so he said that um, he would be happy to have me come to the lab if I would do neuroscience, not immunology. And so I read about neuroscience. And uh, I read a number of review articles. And I thought, hmm, I really thought that uh, immuno a lot of the questions in immunology would be answered within the next 20 years. And indeed, they have been. But, but that it would take a lot longer to understand the brain. And that is also true. <laughs> but it was really fascinating. And uh, I was especially intrigued by the cellular diversity of the nervous system and the molecular diversity of the nervous system. How could there be so many different types of cells in the nervous system? And more importantly, how could they, how could the nervous system get wired up? How could all these neurons connect to each other in precise ways during development to form the neural networks that are necessary to carry out all the diverse functions of the nervous system. But what Richard uh, was interested in doing was not studying the mammalian nervous system, but rather sticking to aplysia, the simple model system. And he suggested several topics. And so I, I took one of those topics and started to explore. I was looking for genes that were involved in a behavior, egg laying, in this model organism, aplysia. And I worked out a technique for cloning genes expressed in one neuron, but not another. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And identify uh, neuropeptides in the animal. And um, it ended up taking a long time, because I ran into something called alternative splicing and found out that the um, the messenger RNA made from this gene that encoded the peptide, um, actually encoded, it encoded a series of peptides that were clipped out of a, of a pre-proprotein to give a whole series of proteins. And it turned out that the gene was expressed in different neurons in the organism, but the gene gave rise to different combinations of peptides in the different cells. So we proposed that this was a way to um, create perhaps different behaviors uh, and constellations of behaviors and physiological effects from a single gene. Anyway, it was as I was nearing the end of that project, um, I read a paper that completely changed my life. So now, while I was doing the Aplysia project, um, I'd been doing side experiments on and off. I was interested in this diversity problem. And that's what had drawn me to immunology. You know, the immune system can recognize a virtually unlimited number of pathogens 
and defend the body against them, something which I found fascinating. And I thought that the diversity I mentioned in the nervous system, the connectional diversity, the cellular diversity, might require, um, well, I was curious about how at a molecular level that diversity would be encoded. And so I was trying to develop on the side a technique for identifying genes that might allow for that diversity by undergoing um, a recombination, as was seen in the immune system. So I was trying to find ways to look for genes that were so-called rearranged to create diversity uh, exclusively in the nervous system. So I tried a number of techniques. So I was very interested in this. And then I read a paper that really fascinated me. And this was on the olfactory system. So it was estimated, of course, the olfactory system is the system that governs the sense of smell. And it was estimated that humans could sense at least 10,000 different chemicals in the environment as having a distinct odor. And even more surprisingly, chemicals that were almost identical in structure could have completely different smells. So orange versus sweaty socks. So this to me was the ultimate diversity problem. And I became completely obsessed with this. And I thought, this was it. I had to solve the problem. And the, the first question was how you can detect 10,000, some people would say up to 100,000 chemicals in the environment in the nose. How was that done? And it had been proposed that there were protein receptors in the nose. And some people had tried to find them, but had not succeeded. So I decided that the first step had to be to find out how odors, odorous molecules or odorants are detected in the nose. And there was nothing that would dissuade me from doing that. That was it. Nothing else mattered. My advice would be to find something that fa fascinates you. And um, I think we heard something about passion from other people at the summit. And <coughs> excuse me, this is also true as a scientist. You, you really want to pick a problem that, that you want to solve, that you find fascinating, that you can but you don't have to be obsessive, but I guess I tend to be that way. But something that you really want to solve, something that fascinates you, and then dedicate yourself to it. Because I do believe that that's where the big discoveries are made. If you already know the answer, it's probably not going to be that great a contribution. Well, I was surprised. It was almost surrealistic hearing this voice on the phone in the middle of the night telling me that we would, Richard Axel and I would receive the prize. Um, it was almost like a voice floating through the ether. It, it, seemed, it really seemed like a dream. And uh, of course then immediately it was uh, a huge commotion, you know, the media, press, press conferences, and telephone calls, and flowers, and cards, and congratulations. And it was uh, quite an amazing experience. <laughs> I realized uh, shortly after being told that, that I would receive uh, the prize that I would have um, new responsibilities. And those would be to be a spokesperson for science. And 
I'm happy to do that. One thing that became very clear to me um, by talking to many people in the press was that there is a very broad a lack of understanding of basic science and its importance for medicine. So you could even say that you could divide biological science into two different areas. One is translational and applied science. So that's where you um, use what's already known about biological systems and translate what's known into medical practice, drugs, um, prevention, detection, and you apply it for um, treatment. But the other side is basic science, and that's what, what I do, and that's where you learn how biological systems work. And you can't have the translational and applied part without the basic science. So I was often asked, what will your findings cure? What disease will this cure? And it's knowledge. What we do is we acquire knowledge about how biological systems work. And it could be that in, in future years, an understanding of the olfactory system will um, provide information that will help the elderly smell better, for example, and, and prevent uh, deficits in, in um, detection that lead to malnutrition that can happen. But more importantly, there's a lateral spread of information in basic science. So what you learn about the olfactory system might later be applied uh, to the understanding of another system. Um, within the brain, like appetite, or the control of blood pressure by the brain, or something in the liver. And it's this that's invaluable about basic science. So you, you need to have, you need to establish the fundamentals. And once you understand the system, then you can understand what goes wrong in disease, and you can then develop cures for what? for disease states. I think that there are a multitude of questions that, to address and uh, in terms of biological science. And of course, as I just said, there's um, the brain is still almost a complete mystery. We don't, under, we don't know about the neural circuits that control um, even innate, innate drives, such as hunger, sleep. We don't know how those things work. Um, we know that they, they're controlled by circuits of neurons, that is, that are interconnected. Uh, neural networks, but we don't know what they are. We don't know what the genes are. There are now um, very large-scale efforts to map genes that are expressed in the brain. And once you can map the genes, that is, determine the neurons that they're expressed in, you can couple that with uh, genetic alterations in animals to study what happens when you turn a gene on or turn it off. And in that way you can learn more about the roles of individual neurons in the neural circuit. Now in the case of smell, we're very interested in how it is that smells can elicit specific kinds of behaviors. Um, predator odors can elicit uh, an instinctive fear response. And so we think that we can use odors or pheromones that also elicit specific innate responses to gain access to those neural circuits that have not been identified yet. And once we can get our hands on one identifiable set of neurons in the brain that's involved in that circuit, then we can move outward from that and start identifying the other neurons 
and then establish what individual neurons in the circuit do. So we've just begun to do that recently, actually. I think I would like to be remembered as, um, this is now harking back to my childhood, as a good, kind person who helped other people. I always wanted to help other people, but I think now the people that I would help would be, uh, in terms of my career, it would be the students and postdoctoral scientists that I worked with and um, helped them to grow. That's very satisfying to me, actually. It's satisfying to me to have a discussion with a student and have the student be right. Because that means that the student has grown and learned. So I find that it's, it's kind of a strange thing, but I find it satisfying.